Well, welcome everybody. Um, this is our last class meeting and uh, I think you're pretty much done with your homework assignments and by now you should have submitted the uh, research paper if you decided to do that. And so the only thing left is the uh, final exam. And uh, just to reiterate what I told you before about that, it's scheduled for Friday the 1st of May. I've got all three of my final exams on Friday. Boo-hoo for me, but it just means that I'm not going to be doing much over next weekend besides grading because final grades are due by noon on Tuesday. So I've got three classes worth of final exams to grade between Friday and Tuesday. But I'll give yours the most attention because, uh, you know, this is a 400 level class and you're seniors and you deserve that extra attention. So our midterm, uh, excuse me, our final exam on Friday is going to be comprehensive and so you can expect questions from at any point during the course and, um, and there will be a disproportionate weight of the points available related to the more recent content. And so I'll tell you right now, there will be a WMS question and there will be a question related to today's content. And so we're going to go through some calculations uh, dealing with um, flow in aquifers to wells. And even though you will have never had a homework assignment, I'm going to give you a well problem on the exam. And I think after you've seen the example we're going to do in today's class, you'll be glad that there's an exam problem because uh, these calculations are uh, relatively easy and they're actually kind of interesting as well. So. Uh, it's a comprehensive test. You can use any of your textbook, note resources. You can use your previously solved homework problems. But what you can't do is communicate with each other or any other person during the exam. And so the only thing that you should submit is the work that you yourself generated, not uh, anything that, you know, a pre-existing solution you found online. Of course, uh, that wouldn't be right. Um, or uh, communicating with each other during the test, that's not right either. So it's just you know what you can figure out and solve with the class materials and the work that you've already done. Any questions related to the final exam discussion that we've just had? It hasn't been much of a discussion, but feel free to pipe in with your typed comments or you know, interject with the microphone at any point today. Uh, I think there's still one student who, yeah, pipe in. Uh, there's one student, it looks like, who hasn't uh, done the course evaluations, and I don't know who. It doesn't tell me who's completed the evaluations um, or what they've said. The, the instructors don't get to see the results of the evaluations until after final grades are posted. And even then, the comments aren't tied to individual students. And so the point is, is there, it seems like there's one more student who still hasn't done the evaluations. And so if you'd like to share your feedback, I'm interested to have it. Okay, so today we're going to be continuing the discussion about uh, subsurface flow. And uh, this topic of water underneath the surface uh, could very easily be the subject of an entire course by itself. And in fact, at a lot of universities, it is the subject of an entire course, if not an entire program of courses. And so it's a complex subject, and we're going to be making a lot of simplifying assumptions just to be able to uh, come up with a couple of... Um, equations that we can use for problem solving. Um, I want to begin with a concept <clears throat> that's important to understand with the calculations and the discussion we're having today. And this is an aerial view of Marshall's campus. And uh, let's say that someone put a water pump. Yeah, I guess that icon doesn't really show it very obviously. The thing at the center, <laughs> that's supposed to be a water pump. And the point that I'm making here is that we have flow that's radially approaching a center point where the water is being withdrawn. So if we did put a pump in the middle of Buzzkirk Field and you started um, you know, yanking on the handle of that pump and you're removing water from the aquifer, so if you dig deep enough down you're going to reach a water table where all of the voids in the soil matrix are filled with water. Um, you know, Below that water table it's saturated. So if you start to pump, then you're going to be removing some of the water and to replace the water that was removed, um, water is going to have to flow from out, you know, from further away towards the point where the water is being removed. And so if the water is being removed here at the center, then the flow is coming from all directions towards that center point. 
And the thing that you have to think about is that the water is accelerating as it approaches that center point. Because the, uh, think about if you were to do a numerical integration, you know, the sort of thing where you have a differential, R, D, R. Um, if you have a circular element, the area of the circle that the water is flowing from, as the radius decreases, the velocity has to increase for the same volume of water to be approaching that well. So the water par particle that started here uh, at the furthermost edge of this circle of influence, so if the water particle is approaching the center point, it's going slowly at first, but the closer it gets, it's speeding up and it's going faster and faster and faster, and it's because of continuity. If we did a uh, a control volume analysis and we look at the flow in and the flow out, when you have a big circumference, that's going to mean that the area that the water is flowing through is large, but as the circumference of the circle decreases because you're approaching that center point, then the, uh, then the velocity of the water has to accelerate. And so that, this top view of a well, is why uh, we see drawdowns with the pattern that uh, that is shown here in this figure. And the pattern that I'm talking about is that the cone of depression is getting progressive, progressively steeper and steeper as you approach uh, that discharge well. And so um, remember what I said is that the water is speeding up. And why does it have to speed up? It's because the uh, now we're thinking not just of the top view area, but now we're thinking about the volume. The, the volume of aquifer that is being drained is decreasing the closer you get to the well. And so you know there's a, an amount of water inside the soil matrix, and the closer you get to the well, the water has to be moving more quickly um, because the contributing volume decreases. I, I don't know, it's a complex uh, phenomenon to describe, but the basic trends that were introduced in that uh, Wednesday video that I asked you to watch was uh, number one, that if you have a uh, very porous and a high hydraulic conductivity type media, then the cone of depression doesn't have to be as steep because the water flows with um, less resistance towards the well. And so if you have like a very porous sand, the cone of depression wouldn't be as steep as if you have a, um, a silt. And, um, and the, more you dis the more you're pumping out, the steeper the cone of depression is going to be. And uh, the drawdown, this, this phrase drawdown, is referring to the difference in elevation between the water table before pumping started. So you can see the static water table here is where the water level was before that pump was flipped on and then the water started to have to uh, the cone of depression is kind of like it's the hydraulic gradient that's forcing the movement of the water and you know we did graphs in both hydraulic engineering and in fluid mechanics um, graphs of the energy grade line and the hydraulic grade line and so for example if you have a pipe that's connected to a tank, you can have some imaginary line that describes you know, what is the pressure head in that pipe as the water is flowing through it. And in, in a lot of ways, this is similar to those energy grade line, hydraulic grade line figures that we, we developed. And um, the water surface is in a very real way giving you an idea of the, the driving force that's, um, that's moving the water radially towards that well. So what we're going to do with the equations that we're looking at today is try and describe the shape of the cone of depression. And so they can be used, number one, to tell you what would the cone of depression look like for a certain known flow rate. Or you can calculate what flow rate would arise uh, if you have penetrating wells and you're actually making a physical observation of where the cone of depression is. And so if you have two wells, uh, two locations where you're measuring what is the water height, then you can use those measurements to predict the, the discharge um, from the well in question. Now just to review a couple of terms, 
Uh, hydraulic conductivity is uh, often introduced when you're first learning about Darcy's Law and it describes the ability of a fluid to flow through a soil and it has units of length per time. So for example, meters per day or centimeters per second. Um, the thickness of the aquifer is the vertical distance that the water can flow through the soil. And we'll be looking today at both confined aquifers where there is a layer of clay or a layer of rock or some other confining layer at the top and the bottom of the aquifer. So that's a confined aquifer. And then an unconfined aquifer is one where there isn't a top layer on top of it. So we'll need to measure the thickness of the aquifer for these uh, well equations that we're going to be working with. And transmissivity is when you combine the two properties together, the conductivity of the uh, soil and then the thickness of it. And this, when multiplied together, transmissivity gives you an idea of how productive and how easily the water can flow um, through the soil media towards the well. And the piezometric head is when we are going to be um, working with the confined aquifers, we actually won't see a physical cone of depression. Um, it will just be a hypothetical cone of depression because the location of the water, the water table won't draw down as it approaches the um, the well because there's a layer of clay and so rather than being an actual drawdown of the water layer itself it'll be a drawdown of the pressure and so it'll be a drawdown of the piezometric head. And finally um, if we talk about the voids inside of a soil matrix the effective porosity is how much of the porosity the water can actually flow through and it's largely whether the voids are interconnected or whether they're isolated and so maybe you've seen like lava rock, for example, you know, really light rock that sometimes gets put into, put into barbecues for some reason. Um, but that, that rock has a lot of bubbles in it, and sometimes the bubbles are connected, and if they're connected, then the liquid can flow through those connected voids. But if the bubbles are isolated and surrounded on all sides by rock, then the water can't flow through those voids. And so effective porosity looks at the overall porosity and takes into account how interconnected the voids are and whether there are dead ends along the way. All right, so the simplest case is the case of a confined aquifer. And uh, this diagram is showing a side view of the well. And uh, in contrast to, I just want to skip back to this, this figure that we were looking at moments ago. This is actually the water surface. So the cone of depression in this image is talking about where the water table itself is. And this is an unconfined aquifer because there isn't any layer at the top that is limiting where the water goes vertically above the bottom. There is a bottom confining layer, but not a top confining layer. All right, so now that said, that was an unconfined aquifer. This is a confined aquifer. And what makes it confined is that there's this layer like a roof, if you think of it, a rock or a clay layer that is a very low hydraulic conductivity. And so there's an upper confining layer and a lower confining layer. And in between, here's this region where the water has a, uh, an easier path towards the well. And inside of this part of the aquifer, the hydraulic conductivity is much higher than in the confining rock or clay that's both above and below. <clears throat> so rather than a drawdown of the water surface, what we're seeing is a drawdown of the piezometric surface. And so a piezometer is an instrument that allows you to indirectly measure how much pressure there is at a location. And uh, you may remember that when we were talking about piezometers in fluid mechanics, the idea was as if you punctured a pipe, if you put a hole in a pipe and then connected a tube to the pipe, then the water level would rise to a certain elevation. And how high the water level rises is an indication of how much pressure was in the pipe. And so the same thing is true here. If you penetrate this aquifer, the water level will rise to a certain elevation. And so the elevation that the water level would rise to is the piezometric surface. Now, here at 1 and location 2, the idea is we could put in a monitoring well 
and we could find out if we punctured this well and we were just kind of measuring you know how far is it from the ground uh, air interface and so we call that the surface you know, if you were standing here at the surface and you drilled down how far do you have to go until you find where the water table is so here in the confined aquifer we've got B is the height of the um, this segment of the aquifer that's between the confining layers so that's what B is H sub W is the water height inside of the well so this is the height of water the depth of the water in the well when the pumping is going on and if the pumping isn't going on and if things haven't reached the steady state equilibrium then the water level is going to be this initial piezometric surface so you know if you've drilled this well and sometimes let's say you you're a farmer irrigating a field and you only irrigate one day per week then the rest of the week the water level in that well is going to be up here but then as soon as you turn on the pump then the drawdown will occur and what we'll be drawing down is the piezometric surface and so the only place you'll actually see the water level that has been physically changed compared to the initial surface would be in the well itself the physical elevation of the water won't be changed because the water was only ever in this confining layer it's just that the pressure went down so initially before the pumping turns on then the pressure is high here but then when the pumping is turned on and it reaches equilibrium then the pressure is decreasing in the direction of flow and think about it that makes sense you know our understanding of pipe hydraulics was that water flows in the direction of from high pressure towards low pressure and so we can think of this aquifer as kind of like a pipe it's a pipe where the water is flowing towards some center location and the water wouldn't be flowing unless there was a driving force and the driving force that causes the water to go towards the well is this um, piezometric surface that's decreasing and so the pressure decreases in the direction of flow all right so here we have an equation this q sub w will allow us to determine what's the flow rate at the well and it's a function of the uh, transmissivity of the uh, of the aquifer and so T if you remember T was the hydraulic conductivity K multiplied by B the height of the aquifer and so K is a, a soil property that would be given in most problem statements or determined through a soil survey uh, H2 minus H1 is the uh, head of the um, the piezometric head um, inside of the aquifer you know how high the water level would rise to if you had a monitoring well and the direction is really important too in this case is always further away from the well and so you know one versus two these equations only work if you um, have two being the location that's further away from the center axis and one is the location that's closer okay so just to get a sense for how this equation works let's uh, oh by the way this is what the equation and the resource looks like in the uh, FE manual I know that some of you probably have plans to take the FE test um, I guess not anytime soon though right um, there are certain exams that are starting to go online like I think you can take the GRE online at home but I don't think that they're gonna do the FE that way they are so choosy about exam security it may be a while before you, before anybody has a, a chance to take the FE which is a pity but anyways someday eventually I hope you take the FE exam and when you do if you look inside the uh, supplied reference handbook uh, the um, flow for a confined aquifer is the theme equation and so this is how they show it and so let's just look at the variables that they're showing there is uh, H is referring to the distance from the bottom confining layer up to where the water surface would be if the water could flow above the aquitard and so the aquitard is the upper uh, confining layer that limits where the water 
uh, can actually rise to. So this is essentially the same equation I showed you on the on the previous slide. In this case, they they define the units for each of the uh, each of the variables going in. And the FE manual sadly has a lot of the uh, problems and units in traditional. So that's why here they've put you know, feet squared per second, feet, and so on. All right, so let's try this out. Um, here's our confined aquifer, and what we want to find out is uh, what flow rate do we experience for the conditions that are described? What they're telling us is the hydraulic conductivity. So the K value for this uh, aquifer, the K value is 20 meters per day. That's pretty high. That's a big hydraulic conductivity. Uh, the thickness of the aquifer, so that's defining the parameter B, is 6.6 .6 meters. And then rather than telling us, um, let's see, the initial piezometric surface of 14.53 14, 14 above the lower confining layer. All right, so they're telling us H. So they're saying from the lower confining layer up to where the initial water surface would be, the initial piezometric surface is 14.53. And so they're saying, uh, what flow rate? Find Q so that at a radius of um, 40 meters, so R1, then the uh, initial, the, then the piezometric surface would be 13.85. So that is H1. So the H1 is 13.85 at R1 of 40, and then R2 is 85 meters, and, and then the H2 is 14.31. So there has been some drawdown. Drawdown is the difference between where it used to be and where it is now. This equation is in terms of what are the actual heights. And so that's the data that you've get, been given. So this first point here, find out the, uh, the flow rate so we're solving for Q, and you can find the transmissivity with K times B. The H1 and the H2 is given, the R1 and the R2 is given, and so find that flow rate. I'm gonna pause for a moment, give you a chance to uh, get a scratch piece of paper, dust off your calculator, and find for the flow rate. Okay, um, so just defining the variables here, the transmissivity is going to be the hydraulic conductivity multiplied by the thickness of the aquifer, so it's 132 meters squared per day for the transmissivity. And if we substitute that into the well equation, remember it's critical that location 2 is the one with the further radius. and so. R2 is 85 meters, R1 is 40 meters. So the, the, the distance that's further away from the well is location two. And then the heights have to, to match that as well. Otherwise, you'll get some funky math that just won't work out. So H2 is the, the larger uh, height H1 is the smaller height. So what we should get is that the well is producing 506 cubic meters per day. So that's what the well is producing if we were going to observe that piezometric surface drawdown that's described. Now one of the interesting things about this equation is that you don't actually have to have two monitoring wells besides the, uh, the pumping well. You actually only need one monitoring well and then you can use the height of the water at the pumping well as one of the locations. And so what I'm saying is, is that uh, if you know the diameter of the well, then your location one and your height one can be what's going on at the well itself. So here in this second bullet point, it's saying what is the water depth at the well if the well diameter is 0.5. So what we've done from the first part 
is we figured out that the flow rate is, what was it, 560 cubic meters per second. So we know the flow rate Q, we know T, and we're saying let's have R1 be 0.25 meters. And so R2 can be either of the previous values. We could use either the 40 meter location for R2 or we could use the 85 meter location for R2. It's just we're going to use the well itself, the production well, as our location 1. So H1 is going to be unknown, but H2 will be you know, whichever of these other locations that we selected as our location 2, then we will use the uh, height of the piezometric surface for H2. So in other words, solving for H1. Okay, I'll pause for a moment again and you know, with the givens that we have, using the flow rate that we calculated the first time around, so we calculated it was 506. So 506 cubic meters per day is Q. So if that Q is given, then what is H1? Okay, um, so if the diameter of the well is half a meter, then that means the R1 is going to be half of the diameter. So 0.25 meters will be the radius from the center of the well out to the edge of that production well casing. R2, I use the location that's 40 meters away from the center of the well. It could, you could also have used R2 as the, uh, the other location that's further away, and then you just use its corresponding H2 value. You'll get the same answer either way. Uh, and then from the previous calculations, we determined that the flow rate's 506 cubic meters per day. So if we rearrange this equation um, for the... Um, the confined aquifer and we're going to try and solve for um, H1 and you can see I've kind of not as neatly as I maybe ought to have that's the rearranged well equation solving for H1 and so it's going to be the H2 elevation minus the drawdown and uh, by the way that's just not as neat. That's saying logarithm. So we're doing the logarithm of the ratio of the radii. So the uh, H1, the water is going to be 10.75. Uh, so back to this, we're saying that the water elevation from the bottom up to the depth of water in that well is 10.75 meters at the well. So it's kind of interesting that you can have just one monitoring well besides the production well if you also measure the elevation of the water at the production well. Okay, so that's the confined aquifer. And the confined aquifer is the easier of the two cases. The, uh, the equation gets a little bit different for an unconfined aquifer. We have to make a, a slight correction if the aquifer is unconfined. Are there any questions about this example that we did. Okay. Here is the situation if it's unconfined. Now, the unconfined, what does it lack? In, in the previous slide, the FE reference manual showed that we had an aquitard. Uh, it's the upper confining layer that doesn't exist here. And so there's a lower confining layer, but there's no upper confining layer. So we have clay or rock at the bottom. The well is fully penetrating, going all the way down, and we assume that it's screened 
the entire depth. And so now instead of measuring just the piezometric surface, this is the actual water surface. And so the ferratic surface is, that means that's the water surface in the aquifer. So it's the differentiation between fully saturated pores below the ferratic surface or um, unsaturated voids above it. <clears throat> uh, so the equation looks really similar, except for that you'll notice that um, we have the, uh, um, in this case, the, uh, the hydraulic conductivity rather than the transmissivity. And, um, and so in the previous equation, we were using transmissivity. Here it's the hydraulic conductivity, and then it's the, uh, the heights are squared. They aren't squared in this equation. So H2 and H1 aren't squared, but they are squared in the unconfined aquifer equation. Uh, this is how it appears in the uh, FE reference manual. So Dupuit, I guess that's probably a French name. But what it's showing is that the actual water surface is declining as you approach the, uh, the pumping production well. And so um, notice that uh, in this equation, I'm going to ask you to calculate the drawdown. And so there's going to be a conversion that you have to make between the, uh, the height of the water that's calculated and the drawdown. Um, this is saying uh, for a given flow rate out of 0.3 cubic meters per second, and then the uh, saturated thickness is 24 meters. And so H, when the uh, water hasn't started pumping, the initial surface would be 24 meters, would be the height of the water. And what we know is the uh, if you go 50 meters away, so location 1, because that's the closer of the two, we've got one location that's 50 meters away and another one that's 100 meters away. So at location 1, the drawdown is 1 meter. And then at location 2, 100 meters away, the drawdown is 0.5 meters. So drawdown is this gap distance here. So here in the figure, they're calling it S sub R. S is the drawdown as a function of how far away the radius you are from that pumping location. And so um, part A, calculate the hydraulic conductivity for what's described. We don't know what's the hydraulic conductivity, but we do know the flow rate. And from the drawdowns that are mentioned, the drawdown is what you would actually observe if you were at the, uh, at the observation wells. You'd know where the water surface used to be before pumping, and you know how far it is down to the water now that uh, the pumping has started. So from the drawdown that's mentioned, you get the H values. And then with the H values and the radii, you can rearrange this Dupuis equation to solve for K. So let's do that for step A. Let me pause for a moment and give you a chance to rearrange this equation algebraically to solve in terms of K. And then what you're going to need to substitute in for H2 and H1 is the initial height, 24, minus the drawdowns. Okay, so first things first, you can see how I have uh, determined the H1 and the H va H2 value from the drawdowns that were described. Uh, so the initial uh, height of the water table is 24 meters above the lower confining layer. And the problem statement defined the drawdown at location 1 and the drawdown at location 2. And so the drawdown is more at the location that's closer to the well. So location 1 is closer to the well, location 2 is further away. And so the H values are going to be the initial height minus their drawdown. So 23 meters at location 1, 23.5 at location 2. And if we take the Dupuis equation and rearrange it to solve for K value, here's what it should look like. 
And so substituting in the known radius at location 2, the radius at location 1, and then the h2 and h1 values, then what you ought to get is a hydraulic conductivity of 3.8 times 10 to the minus 3 meters per second. Okay, so that gives us the hydraulic conductivity. And uh, in part B, with now that we know that hydraulic conductivity, we could predict what drawdown is going to be observed 5 meters from the well. So that's closer than either of the two measurements that we've had already. We had a drawdown that was 50 meters away and a drawdown that was 100 meters away. So if you're only 5 meters from the well, the drawdown should be a lot more because you're closer to the well casing. So if we were 50 meters away and it was, on, it was only 1 meter of drawdown, then the drawdown should be a lot more than 1 meter when you're that close to the well. So let's take a look at that. So the drawdown at a radius of 5 Oh, I may not have that here in my notes. I guess that means I'm going to have to pause and uh, calculate it. And let's see if we end up with the same thing. All right, so we're going for part B here, trying to figure out what would be the drawdown at a distance 5 meters from the well. Um, let me show you what my solution looks like that for that. Hopefully you also have double checked and our numbers line up. So what we're saying is um, our location one, the one that's closer, is 5 meters away. I'm going to use the location where 50 meters away it had the height of 23. So the K value we found from, the, uh, from part one and the flow rate of 0.3 cubic meters per second was known. So just rearranging the equation for H1, it should look like this, and then substituting in the, the known values, I get an H1 value of 21.26 meters, and then asked for the drawdown. So the drawdown was the initial height of 24 minus the height after pumping begins at this particular location that's only five meters from the well. So that should mean the drawdown is 2.74 meters. Did uh, anybody else get that same value and able to verify 2.74 meters? James, thank you. Logan got the same value. All right, so there will be an exam question. It'll either be an unconfined well or a confined well. And I mean, it's not going to be like the majority of the points on the test. It's just, you know, I want to create some sort of incentive to try and understand and uh, retain this information. Okay, 948. We are out of time for this morning. Um, that's our last class meeting of the semester. You know, the ironic thing is here we've only had 38 class meetings uh, this semester. Um, Two years ago, there would have been 45 class meetings. And now, you know, we lost three because of the week that classes were suspended. So we should have had more than we got, but uh, they, they cut a week from the semester even before this pandemic thing happened. So in a normal semester, a couple of years ago, this uh, class would have included some more material. So I'm sorry that we had to streamline out some of that content, but I hope that it's been useful for you. I hope that uh, through your career you're able to find opportunities to apply the concepts of hydrology. I appreciate all your hard work this semester. I've been uh, impressed and pleased with what you've been able to accomplish. So thanks for your attention. And I hope you have a, a good weekend and uh, I will be back in touch with you reminding you about our final exam. Just taking one last look at the announcements. Remember the exam, our test is on Friday. And so that exam will go live on Blackboard at 8 a.m. So you can access the test on Blackboard at 8 and you'll need to submit the test before 10 o'clock. And if you have any questions in the meantime, just get in touch and I'll be glad to respond. Take care. Bye-bye.